Okay, so before we get into complement itself, I just wanted to show this diagram which talks about that we have uh, over the first four hours, a lot of it is just complement and defenses and antimicrobial proteins. Uh, over time, we start including effector cells, uh, if this doesn't work, uh, of the innate immune system, macrophages, neutrophils, uh, all that stuff. And then if that doesn't work, we start to recruit uh, cells of the adaptive immune system. Notice that that's within the first four hours here is strictly the proteins, antimicrobial proteins. From four to 96 hours, so after four hours basically, we start to recruit uh, cells of the innate immune system, monocytes, macrophages, blah. And then adaptive responses is anything after that where we have B cells and T cells. Okay, so complement. Three uh, things that you, you really should, should I, I would advise you to map this out on your own, that it does is it is involved with inflammation. It is a, involved in opsonization. Remember, that's the Greek word for making it tasty. I always think of it like glazing a donut. <laughs> it makes them a lot better for me. And the last thing that it does is it will kill pathogens via by means of the membrane attack complex. We talked about that a little bit. It pokes a hole in them, basically. So for the inflammation we have here, I'm just going to write this, uh, circle this in purple, or pink, whatever color this is. Magenta, I think, actually. Um, inflammatory response, anaphylatoxins, uh, generally the alpha subunits of the complement. We'll talk about that later. For opsonization, that's this right here. It just puts a little tag on there, like glazing on a donut that makes macrophages just want to eat it all the more. And then uh, the membrane attack complex is what I did in blue. So that's three. Um, it's cleared out of immune complexes by your red blood cells. And then it's also in plays a role in uh, the adaptive immunity for five and six here. With B cell immunity, they have receptors for complement. And then involve the T cell memory responses, which we'll talk about when we get into the adaptive immunity. So the name of the game for all three of these pathways here, for both the alternative pathway, the lectin pathway, and the classical pathway, is just to cleave C3 into C3 alpha and C3 beta. C3 beta right here, tags a bacteria for destruction. It doesn't have to be a bacteria. It can be, you know, small little yeasts or protozoa, but any type of a pathogen. Now they all have different ways of doing this, but at the end of the day, this is what's happening here, which does those three things that I just talked about. Inflammation, opsonization, and then the membrane attack complex, which ultimately results in death of the pathogen. Okay, so the alternative pathway, the way that this works, and the way that I feel the need to explain this from the beginning is that with the alternative pathway, we have that molecule C3 in the bloodstream. So C3 is a type of protease enzyme. It's the inactive form. is called a zymogen. I don't think that's really important so much as you understand that it's inactive is, is the main thing. It's made by the liver, secreted by the blood, and it's always in the blood. And just through, uh, I guess, spontaneous uh, actions, just through entropy, um, so I'm just going to write this here that is spontaneously without the use of an enzyme or anything like that, C3 is going to uh, unfold itself and undergo a conformational change where it exposes its thioester bond. Exposes this thioester bond here. If you've taken even uh, your first semester of organic chemistry, you know that carbonyl carbons have a partially negative and a partially positive end to them. And this is going to be uh, an open site for nucleophiles to come in and to bind to this. So. What is the nucleophile? I'll do it in blue, that's a fitting color. In this context, remember, we're floating in the bloodstream. Now, this exposure here in this nucleophile attack is more conducive when it's near the pathogen's surface, but this can happen in the blood as well. It's going to be attacked by water. Not because water is a great nucleophile, just because it's, there's so much of it. Remember, chemical kinetics. So water is going to act like this, and this is going to convert and I'll, I'll do it in gold, I guess, to really iterate. C3 gets converted to C3I, uh, which is the same thing as just saying that you have a C3 molecule with H2O attached to it. It's, it's inactive, C3. Um, I just want to make a quick note that this nucleophile attack of water 
I feel like I keep... Whoa! That was scary. This nucleophile attack of water is not cleavage. A really easily misconceived thing is that the water is cleaving it. The water is not cleaving C3 into the fragments. It's just attacking C3, binding to C3. Anyways, so C3I or C3H2O, C3I is just easier for me to write, so that's what I'm going to keep using here, is going to collide with something, or it's going to make way contact with another protein that is made by our liver that's in our bloodstream called factor B. So they bind together, and um, one of the things that they're going to collide into, or the next thing that's going to come along the lines, is something called factor D. And the way that I remember this, it's really cheesy, but it kind of helps me, is that if I draw an axe, like, like Gimli, his, his, his single-sided axe, the, the sharpie part of the axe, the blade part of the axe, kind of looks like a D to me. You know? And so, <laughs> I know, really cheesy, but factor D, whenever it binds to this, whenever we have this complex here, I'll just go ahead and draw our next step here. So I've gone ahead and just abbreviated this as factor B is B and factor D is D. But anyways, whenever this binds here, this is going to result in the cleavage of factor B into an alpha and beta subunit for it. So, okay, so after factor D comes in and binds and cleaves that, it dissociates away. We have beta alpha, factor B alpha subunit, kind of confusing, I know, that's going to float away. We don't know what that does. But what we result with, what we end up with is factor B's beta subunit bound to C3I. And the significance of this is that this compound here, this factor B subunit bound with C3I is, and I'll draw it out here, this is called a soluble, in the water, C3 convertase. So if it ends in A's, you know that it's an enzyme. What is the enzyme that it's going to act upon? It's going to act upon C3. Going back to that diagram earlier with the cleavage here. So what we have going into this molecule, this convertase is, we have C3 going in and coming out, we're going to get C3 alpha and C3 beta. Now, C3 alpha, you know what that does. It's an inflammatory agent because it's an alpha subunit. That's the way that you should remember that, except for a little bit of exceptions to that rule. But for the purposes of this, smaller ones make good subunits for inflammation. C3 beta is going to do two things. Well, uh, it's going to be an opsonizing agent, and it's going to be, make another convertase for itself. But for the purposes of this, I think it's really just noting that once it's been cleaved, okay, the C3 thioester bond is also exposed, which is subject to yet another nucleophile attack. In this context, the nucleophile is not water, but a much stronger one, presumably the carboxylate end of a protein. In this context, it's the protein of a pathogen, the protein of a bacteria. So what this gives us is C3 beta on the surface of a pathogen. Now, I assumed that it's carboxylate because it's in the zwitterionic form, um, but it can also be the NH2 group with the lone pairs attached to it as well of the bacteria if it's at that end of the terminus, presuming it's not uh, protonated. Anyways, so what this is going to happen here, this format here, once we have this, we're going to get opsonization. Remember, that makes it tasty. It's going to increase the amount of collisions it has with receptor-mediated phagocytosis by other cells, but that's not what I'm going to talk about in this. What I'm going to talk about here is what happens right after this. It's going to bind to factor B, which I'm not even going to draw this out really, but after it binds to factor B, we have factor D come in. I'm getting really crowded, I know. But what we end up with at the end of the day is a C3 beta subunit attached to a pathogen surface. And on top of that is just this B, factor B subunit beta. is is called, it's named after the pathway, the alternative C3 convertase. 
and it does the exact same thing as the soluble C3 convertase. We have C3 going in, C3 gets cleaved, and then this whole thing can happen again and again and again and again and again and again and again. So it has like this almost logarithmic growth. And this is a diagram just showing exactly what I just drew out. We have C3, this is in the plasma. Water is going to attach to it because it just naturally unfolds. Factor B comes in and binds to this. Then factor D comes in and cleaves it, and we now have this. This right here is the soluble C3 convertase. And this is going to cleave C3 into C3 alpha and C3 beta. Keeping on here, I'll use a magenta. C3 beta is open to be exposed by factor B, which will be cleaved by factor D, which gives us right here um, this alternate, this right here. This is the alternative C3 convertase, which will take other molecules of C3, come in, and then cleave them, and cleave them, and cleave them. So in this type of a reaction, 2 becomes 4, 4 becomes 16, and so on, and so on, and so on. So this can happen, this can really get over out of hand really quickly. So uh, the way that we have to have means of controlling this.